I want to welcome you all, and thank you so much for joining us today on this Mother's Day weekend. Can we give all of our moms a big round of applause? Yeah. I love it. On, on Mother's Day, everyone goes to church. On Father's Day, everyone goes to breakfast or, or sleeps in, I don't know, or goes fishing. I don't know, maybe it's getting closer to snapper season. I think that's how all that works out, so they're getting all their boats ready. Uh, but I do want to welcome you, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, if you didn't know it's Mother's Day, there's your warning. You still have plenty of time today. Make sure you call mom, check on her, see how she's doing. But uh, thank you for being here with us today. We've got a great service planned for you. One quick announcement before we get started. Um, we have next Sunday the Military Beach Bash, and uh, this is really our outreach into the military community. Many, many military folks here, retired and active, and, um, and so we're just going to have a big celebration at the beach next Sunday, 4 o'clock, but we need everybody to register because we know it's going to be a lot of people that are going to show up, and so at that number 94,000 text Beach Bash, and that'll get you registered. You can either volunteer or, um, or just come and enjoy it. Uh, we're looking for people to bring desserts and side items. And so anyways, consider that. If that's, if that's something you're looking to be a part of, then maybe that's a way that you can connect. You guys ready for a great Sunday? Yes. All right, awesome. I invite you, if you will, to go ahead and stand. And um, let's start off this service by praying the Lord's Prayer and getting our hearts on the same page. Let's do that this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gorgeous morning, God. And, and whether we're here in person or online, and God, we just, we just connect our hearts to you. And, and God, it's it's in, it's in our belief in you, it's in our faith where we find and we experience life. And so God, we thank you for that connection today. On this Sunday morning, we're mindful of our moms. And I know that doesn't mean the same thing for every person. Some of us are struggling today, some of us are celebrating today, and, and some of us, um, God, we're not even sure how we feel about that. But, but here's, here's the truth. I think there's that mothering, nurturing um, understanding and awareness that we have inside of our lives that draws us back to the truth and the hope that we all hold on to, which is Jesus Christ. And so God, thank you for today. Um, and, and wherever we find ourselves, I pray that you would just minister to our hearts and bring us to a whole new place of understanding this morning. We love you, we trust you, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can go ahead and be seated. I'm gonna do a special this morning for all the mothers out there. This is an original song called One Miracle at a Time. She brings me to life each day with a hug and a kiss. She can heal a skint knee with one touch when it comes to the kids. And somehow she makes one bag of groceries and lasts us all week. And ain't it amazing the ladies in love with me? Got a crick in my neck Cause that woman keeps turning my head The way she looks like a million bucks In that ten dollar dress When I look in her eyes I could swear it's an angel I see And ain't it amazing The ladies in love with me It's nothing short of a miracle Like the promise of a morning sun And God only knows what it takes When he makes two hearts beat as one I end every day the same way I started Thanking the Lord she's mine Oh, I'm looking at love One miracle at a time I end every day the same way I started Thanking the Lord she's mine Oh, I'm looking at love One miracle at a 
living my life one miracle at a looking at love one miracle at a time oh yeah 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 I didn't write it, no. Yes, he wrote that. Yes, he wrote that. Did you really think I wrote that? God bless you, Sue. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers out there. And by the way, I am not going to be here for the next two Sundays. Alaska. Jackie and I are going to Alaska for like nine, ten days, something like that. I'm going to go kill myself up there. We're supposed to be uh, actually going to take a, a um, helicopter to a glacier and actually do some dog sledding, which is going to be exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Have you ever been to Alaska? I've never been to Alaska. It's one of the few. I've, I've been to a lot of states, but it's one that's, I've never been there before. So we're looking forward to that. I hope we come back in one piece. Um, I noticed that they set a low record like four days ago, uh, 26 degrees. <laughs> Jackie's not happy. Uh, but hopefully we'll get up um, in the 50s sometime, so we'll see what happens. Anyway, next two weeks I'm going to be in Anch- in Anch- well, we're going to Anchorage, but we're going to be in Seward and Denali and a lot of the places up there. Uh, so Courtney's going to be here next two Sundays, uh, and he will be uh, giving the message at 8 o'clock. So hopefully you're still here. And maybe I'll get the log on if I can able to do that from up there. Okay, well, over the last several weeks, we have been looking at this subject of prayer, specifically prayer, which we find in, in the New Testament. We had done our little uh, inspection of the, what prayer was like in the Old Testament some weeks ago, but uh, we've been in the New Testament now for a few weeks, and we began some weeks ago in, in Luke chapter 18, and it was the parable. If you remember that parable, that parable was the parable of the persistent widow and the, and the unrighteous judge, the, the bad judge, the ugly judge. Who, and this widow find a, found a way to get this reluctant judge to do what it is and give her justice. And so we, we saw that she understood how to unlock the power of prayer to get things handled correctly in her situation. So we saw that prayer is an absolute imperative in the Christian experience because it really is, prayer is really the only way that you and I, that men and women, that we have in order to re- get resources from the, in, 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 get that power of God to, to work in our lives. It's the only way we can do it. So we started with that and then we went to the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And in, in that parable we learned something about the nature of prayer, you remember? And the old Pharisee was just saying, oh, thank God I'm not like that schmo over there who's just ugly and no good. He cheats people. And look at me, God. I'm so wonderful and I'm so righteous. And so we, we got into that and we found out that prayer is not to be a parade of our accomplishments before God, uh, telling him like who we are and what we've done and how we should be recommended for the next award, nor is it an, an attempt to sort of constrain God, sort of put pressure on God to say, well, look, God, I've done all these things for you. Now, you know, maybe on the other side, you start to do some things for me. So we find out that that wasn't there at all. So that's not, that's what it's about. Then in Luke chapter 11, we examined our Lord's own practice when it comes to the matter of prayer and the attitude of 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 coming to God and coming to the Father with a clean and pure heart. And what we looked at there was that Jesus had such an intimate connection and and his disciples were watching him all the time. They really made the connection. says, you know, he does all these miracles. He has this power. He has this wisdom. He has this aura about him. You know what? But he also always prays. And is there some connection there? And at the close of the prayer, we had one of the unknown named disciples come up and really say to him, says, Lord, would you teach us 
to pray, we, we sense that that is where the real power lies. So we listen to how our Lord's words on, on how to pray. And it began with what we call, well, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually a model prayer. And we looked at the first three petitions of that prayer. And it, it starts with a concept of God, his, his fatherhood, the fact that he is hallowed, and he has this unsullied name, and he has this right to ultimate kingship over not just some areas, but over every area, every closet, every skeleton in our lives. He has the right to lordship over every human heart. Now we're going to come to that part of the prayer that really directly concerns you and me, concerns us. Uh, this is the last section of the Lord's model prayer, and it takes in, in account the whole experience of life, if you will. So got your Bibles? Luke chapter 11, just verses 3 and 4. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone with sins who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now this is a prayer for the whole of mankind. Every man, every woman, every girl, every, every boy that had ever lived. Because it's involving body, soul, and spirit. And Jesus puts his finger on something very squarely and directly. On an area of paramount need in each of these areas in the, in the context of this very, very short model prayer. This prayer properly, if you pray it properly as it should be prayed... There is really nothing else to add to any prayer that you have because this prayer really covers every aspect of life. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but really look at it as a, as a model prayer, if you will. And as we're going to see, this prayer is not intended to be just repeated over and over. Now, I know we repeat this prayer over and over every 8 o'clock service, every 9 o'clock service, every 1030 service, but it behooves us in our hearts and our minds, to not pray it just as a rote prayer. We need to think about what it is we're praying and the impact of what it is we're saying to God. Because if we understand this prayer properly and pray as it should be prayed, there is really nothing further, as I said, to be said, because it does cover every aspect of life. And as we're going to see, this, this prayer is not intended to be just repeated over and over and over again in, in some mechanical fashion. Now this prayer, as I said, has become a guide. It's really a guide. And each of these areas is capable of an expansion almost infinitely as to detail. You could put all sorts of stuff in, in, the, in those just two verses I read. You could put everything in there, but in principle, it's a completely adequate prayer just the way it is. Nothing needs more to be said if we have genuinely prayed this prayer as the Lord indicates we should have. Because there's no area of life that has been neglected. You know, you go back to the first letter to the church at Thessalonica by Paul. Paul actually says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So this prayer should be front and center of something that we are faced with absolutely every single day. Now he begins this section of the prayer with the needs of the body. The needs of the body. He talks about the bread, if you will. So it's interesting to note something here is culturally, the Greeks, which had a great influence on the Israelites during this first century, the Greeks themselves regarded the human body as nothing. They disdained the body. There was nothing good about the body. There, there was nothing that they wanted to do with the body. It was considered coarse. It was considered dirty. It was considered unworthy of redemption. That was what the, uh, the philosophy of the Greeks were. But you know what? That's not what we see what's, what God says about it. God loves the bodies. What did he do? He engineered them. He designed them. 
so that they would be perfectly proper, that we would pray for the needs of what he has designed, engineered, and has given us. But when we talk about bread here, we're not talking about bread, literal bread. We're talking about everything that we need to live our lives physically, all the necessities of a physical life. Yeah, bread, but also wine, also water, also clothing, also shelter, on and on and on. So the vital concern here is that there would be available to us an immediate unbroken supply of those things that we absolutely need to draw breath. And the only limit on this prayer is that we are never ever to pray for what we could call like a big warehouse full of stuff. Remember, go back to the Old Testament. How often did the manna show up? Daily. If you try to take more, what happened to the manna that you picked up? It spoiled. You couldn't eat it. It was a daily thing. And that's really what we're looking to do. To pray daily for the things that we're going to need that very day. We're going to pray for a one-day supply. So the question that we need to really ask ourselves, is that what we do? Do we really pray for our daily needs? And some people would say, well, you know, I say grace before every meal. And I mean, tons of people do. But once again, how perfunctory, you know, how rote, how mechanical are we doing that when we, when we say that prayer? So, you know, maybe it's become such a familiar request in the repeating of the Lord's Prayer that maybe it's lost some of its meaning for you as you go through it. Now, some people will argue this, though. They'll say, well, Jesus also said this, and I'm quoting Jesus. He said, your father knows that you have need of these things even before you pray. So some people will say, so if he knows that, then really it's not necessary to inform God of our needs. After all, isn't that sort of wrong to remind God of what he already knows? And there's some people say, who, who cares one way that it makes a little difference whatsoever. And they say that because, you know what, it seems like the necessities of life show up at their doorstep every day, irrespective of whether they pray or they don't pray. Uh, and then they'll also say this, they'll say, you know what, there are a whole lot of people who never bothered to pray at all. They may have prayed in their entire life. And guess what? I know a lot of people like that are eating steak and lobster and double chocolate pie every day. Yet here I am as a Christian and I'm eating a dry hamburger and maybe some green jello. I mean, how fair is all of that? So what's the point of praying? What's the point? But the answer to that question really touches on the central issue of what prayer and what the value of prayer is all about. Because prayer is not something by which we inform God of our needs. He knows that. It's not an attempt to sort of extort him or bribe him and saying, I'm going to do all these great things for you, God. Take care of me. Instead, prayer is designed not to influence God, it's to influence and do something for us. Because it's, those, it's us. We're the ones who need this kind of prayer. Not, God doesn't need this prayer. Of course he knows what we need. Because there's not a, one speck of your life that he doesn't, he's not intimately aware of. So what is necessary is that we have a conversation. We talk to him about it. We tell him about it. We get, we get a relationship going with him. That's the most important thing. Want to ask, you, ask yourself this question. What happens to me when I neglect this area of prayer in my life? And I'm sure that we've all gone through dry periods in our life where we have done exactly that, where we have we've neglected to go to God regularly in prayer, whether it's the Lord's Prayer or whether it's grace or whether it's something that you just want to pray about. Because I think if you are honest, 
what you're going to see when you, you go through those areas of life, there's going to be a slow and subtle change take place in your heart over a period of time. You won't notice it right away, but you're going to see, over you look back, you're going to see things have changed. You know, when a Christian does not take the time and pray for his or her daily supply of those physical needs of bread and food and shelter, what begins to happen is that we start to take those things for granted. We take them for granted. And gradually, we sort of give in and we succumb to that foolish delusion. Look what I did. I mean, they're coming to me. I must be doing something right. I can provide these necessities for myself. I don't need any help. I certainly don't seem to need God's help because I haven't been praying and yet here they are. So we become possessed with the incredible vanity. When you think about it, it's incredible vanity that, that your smarts, your wisdom, your abilities have really made all these things possible to you. It's crazy. The book of Daniel, great book of the Bible, it accurately describes an occasion where this type of thinking, and we read the story of a guy by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar. This was the proud monarch, the king of Babylon. He is the greatest king in the greatest empire of its time. And the story goes in, in the prophet Daniel that he goes out on his, out on his palace wall one evening and he, he's looking up in the city and, and he says this, he says, is not this, and he's looking around at, at this, this great city, is not this the great Babylon which I have made? I've made it. My wisdom has built all this, and my ability has brought all this to pass. Everything here is, is a result of what I have done. You remember what the story is? He reveled in what he thought were his powers by which all of this came to pass. And it didn't take very long. As a result of that assumption, God did something. He brought down upon him the judgment of bestiality, is what he did. As a result of that foolish assumption, God turned him into a cow, a beast. And he became a beast. He turned out in the fields and he ate grass. He was like an animal. And it was God's dramatic way, very dramatic way of saying that ingratitude causes men to become animal-like. There's a symbolism here. We become animal-like. Survival of the fittest. I'm going to get what I need. And all that self-awareness of a beast growling over his food is really what becomes true of us as well. Second request of this prayer moves in the area of relationships, human relationships. Our conscious life, our emotions, our intellect, our will, and so forth. And here we see the need for a cleansed conscious. It's really what it is. For a sense of a desire for peace and rest between you and God and between you and your fellow men and women. And when we pray this, we're asking for the reality that God promises to absolutely every believer in Christ Jesus. And this is really what we're, we're praying for. One of my favorite, favorite verses of the entire Bible, Romans 8, chapter 1. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Is there anything that troubles you and I, troubles other Christians more than a sense of guilt? Anything more that troubles us than dragging around a sense of guilt everywhere we go. You know, because guilt is really the most frequent problem behind 
the distressing ailments that are evident in the experience of a believer. I'm just not talking physical, I'm just talking about emotional and spiritual and mental. If we have laid hold of the forgiveness of God, if we've laid hold of that, we know there is nothing any longer between us and the Lord. I just read it. Do you accept it as truth? Therefore, there is now, present time, wherever you are, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What's that do to your guilt? It's already been wiped clean. He's not holding you account for that sin, for what you're dragging around. Our hearts are absolutely free before him. And the result of that is a pervading, all-encompassing sense of peace. Jesus, however, does have a limitation here. In the first part of this prayer, where we're, we're, we're dealing with the physical, we pray only about the needs for that day. So here we cannot say to God, forgive us our sins unless we are willing and have said to others that they are forgiven for their trespasses, their sins against us. Jesus is not referring here to that divine forgiveness that accompanies conversion. That's taking place. That's what I just read about. There is no condemnation. The Lord's prayer is meant for Christians. Remember that. The Lord's prayer, the model prayer is meant for Christians. And only Christians can really pray that prayer intelligently because it's addressed to us. A non-Christian receives forgiveness from God on the basis of claiming to forgive everyone else. That doesn't happen. No non-Christian ever receives forgiveness from God by saying, well, I'm going to forgive everyone else because he's not put his relationship with Jesus Christ in front of everything, which is paramount. Everything comes from that. It's impossible for him to forgive until he himself first received the forgiveness of God. And that forgiveness is offered on the basis of what? Not in nothing he did, or he felt, or he prayed. It's done on the basis of the blood, the death, and the resurrection of who, in whom he places his trust. And that's Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, he says this, in him, meaning in Christ, we have redemptive, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So it's all grace. It's all grace. We come thanking him for what the death on the cross has already done in taking away that der- terrible burden of sin and guilt and shame that we drag through life with us. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't do one thing for your witness. People, if you're dragging your guilt and your shame around with you and people are seeing that, they're saying, why would I want that? I would never want to do that. Jesus is saying that if you're a Christian, there is no need to pray this prayer. Father, forgive my sins. If you are holding a grudge against someone else, or you're burning with resentment, or you're burning with anger, or bitterness, or you know, you're eating your heart out because something's gone on, or there's some real or fancied threat or some sort of thing that's coming down at you from someone else, He says, don't bother saying forgive my sins then. Remember what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. Verses 23 and 24 of chapter 5. He tells us this, Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. These numbers are so little up here. I I challenge you to come up here and read this. Therefore, is that the way it starts? Oh, I'm good. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. 
first go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. In other words, forgive him, forgive her, and then the healing, forgiveness of God is going to do something to you. It's going to flood your heart. It's going to overflow your heart. And you're going to find that there is nothing then that can destroy or move, move you away from the God-given peace that he's going to give you that's going to resonate and it's going to settle in the deepest areas of your heart. You know, if we refuse, and it's easy for us to do, you know, say, well, you don't know, that's some bad stuff that happened to me. But if we refuse to forgive someone else, you're really, look at it this way, you are really withholding from another person the grace that has been given and shown to you. We have no right to do that. It is only because we have already been forgiven and we have been forgiven the great and staggering debt of what we've done in our lives and our sins. It's only because of that that we can ever find the grace to forgive the slights and hurts someone else has heaped upon us. Have you ever spoken to someone in conversation and had them say something like this to you? I'm a Christian. But this other person did this awful, terrible, hurtful thing to me, and I can't get over it, and I can't forgive them. Have you ever said that? I want you to consider for a moment that what that person is really saying is not that he can't forgive, but that he won't forgive big difference in those two words. If we take these words seriously, this is going to make an absolutely huge difference in your life and in my life. It's going to make a difference in our homes, it's going to make a difference in our workplaces, in our churches, any place we go. Because we're, we'll never discover what God means in terms of the sweetness of the forgiving grace that He offers if we are not willing to melt that black and dark frost that is set up on our hearts and has withered the relationships with others over the years. When we are ready to forgive another, to forgive others, then he says that this great grace is ours as well. Third area of this prayer is in the realm of the Spirit. He says, and lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. In the spiritual realm, the greatest needs we have are for deliverance and protection. Yet Scripture says something to us. It reveals something to us that temptation is necessary for you and for me and for every Christian, and no one, no one, escapes it when you live the Christian life. Temptation is going to come. Now we know, because it's a promise of God, that we will never be tempted, He will never tempt us to sin. He's not going to push us in that direction, yet He does test us in the Christian life. Because He knows that some of the discouraging circumstances and these things that we face they become instruments. They become the way that we grow and that we mature. They're the things that build us up. And they actually are the things that give us victory in the long run. Then we're confronted with this question. Are we really expected to pray that God will not do what he must do to accomplish his work in our lives? Well, you know what? Even Jesus was led into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by Satan. So what does he mean when he says, lead us not into temptation? He went into temptation. You know, maybe we ask this question, could it be that what he means that this prayer, this is a prayer to be kept from unrecognized temptation? Think about it. 
When temptation is recognized as such, it can be resisted. It can actually can be resisted pretty easily. And when we do resist it, it's always a source of strength. It's always a source of maturing. It's always a source of growth in our lives. You know, it's coming near April 15th, and you guess what you are doing? You are filling out your tax forms. Oh, lucky you. And you're filling it out, and you notice that there was some income. Oh, you remembered it. There was some income that came your way that past year. You know what? It's totally untraceable because you know what? You got it in cash. There's no paper record here whatsoever. And so you're, uh, you're filling out your tax return, and at that moment, you are confronted with something. It's called a temptation to not report that money. You know it's wrong. You know it's wrong. You don't have to open your Bible. You don't have to have someone tell you that. You know it. When you resist that temptation, what you're going to find is you're going to be stronger the next time when a larger amount comes into play and is involved. You see, when we recognize Lust as lust, greed as greed, hate as hate, cheating as cheating. When we recognize those things, that's one thing. It's a rather simple matter to resist obvious evil. But sometimes when you think about it, temptation is not always so simple. And sometimes it's totally unrecognizable. You know, look at the life of Peter. Peter is a great example of this. He's in the upper room, and he brashly proclaims, you know, he's, he's out there. Jesus, even if everyone else in this world falls away on account of you, I never will. You can count on good old Peter. I'm going to be there for you. And then he walks out of that upper room, with these words from his master still ringing in his ear, Peter, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me, not once, but three times. And we know what happens. We know exactly what happens. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. But Peter didn't obey, paid no attention, didn't heed Jesus' words. Instead, what did he do? Fell asleep. Lord comes back, finds him asleep, wakes him up again, asks him, Peter, please pray. And still Peter did not pray. He slept. Jesus was asking Peter to pray for himself because he knew something. He knew that the temptation Peter would face in just a little short time. Because right after that, in the court of the high priest, you know the story. Satan took Peter and he wrung his courage out of him like a wet dish rag. Wrung it right out of him. Jesus, Peter denied his Lord three times and he fled in the night, weeping bitterly. I can't imagine a human being under greater attack and feeling worse than what Peter felt that night. Jesus knew he was going to be, he's going to be tempted. And he paid no attention. So that's what Jesus refers to in this phrase. The prayer is really the recognition of our foolish weakness and our tendency to live our lives and stumble, if you will, and trip from one event to another in our lives, one after the other. Because it's not a question of, will you feel temptation? It's a question, okay, here it is. It's a question of when and to what degree it's going to come. When those hard times do come, when life seems to 
you know, you're at the you're at the plate, and all of a sudden life is throwing you. He's not throwing fastballs. He's not throwing. He's throwing balls that are moving. They're curving. They're sliding. They're doing all sorts of things, and you're swinging that bat right and left, and you're missing every pitch that's coming in. Do you feel the temptation to moan and groan and complain and even question the existence of God, which a lot of people do? Why would he allow this to happen to me? Haven't I been faithful? Look what I've done. I don't deserve this. There are tons of people worse than I am. If you're starting to think that way, think back to the disciples, the apostles. The apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ faced many more curveballs as they served their master than you and I will ever have to face. And when the good times come, and they do, and things are going really well, they're going smoothly for you. This is good. Might be a new job offer that came your way, totally unexpected. Maybe it was a promotion to the job that you really wanted, and boy, look at that new paycheck I've got. Maybe the dream house I never thought was affordable has now come on the market, and look at that price. I think I'm going to be able to get into it. All those blessings, big and small, how do you react to them? How do you respond to them? It's critical. You respond, all my hard work has paid off. I did it. I finally arrived. Or you hear from your family and friends, well, you deserve it. Look at, look at how long you waited. Look at all the work that you've done. You know, we have a tendency, a very, very good tendency to forget the one who provides all those blessings. And pride starts to reign supreme in our lives. And the, the temptation you face also can lead to questioning the existence of God, just like those who faced troubles and wondered where God was through it all. You can, you can lose God real quick in the blessings just as fast as you can lose them in the trials. As I close today, let me ask you a question. Do we even recognize temptation when it stares us directly in the face? Anything that, anything that diverts our attention, that diverts our love, that moves us away from obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ is a temptation. And that temptation is one that is critical for us to see, to understand, and to reject. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, this model prayer that we've looked at is so rich, so full. It talks about the physical needs. It talks about the spiritual needs. And Lord, allow us as we read this prayer and say this prayer, Lord, allow us to never, ever get used to it. When I say used to it, don't ever let us get to a point where it just becomes words to us and we don't read into exactly what it is you're telling us of how critical it is to be in relationship with you, to be in conversation with you, to know that absolutely everything that comes our way, good, bad, and indifferent, are gifts from you. And allow that prayer to build up in our hearts so that we can not only see how it relates to us, but to our families and friends. So Lord, we thank you so much for never, ever giving up to us. For giving us the truth that there is now no condemnation for any of us who are in Christ Jesus. The guilt is, is, is a way. Allow us to drop it at the foot of the cross and walk away from it. That's all part of this model prayer. So we thank you for this time. We thank you for the gift of your son 
And Lord, we must assuredly thank you that you've never given up on us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. I will see you in three. I'll probably bring the mush dogs back with me. <laughs>